Welcome to the DIY Writer Show with the mild-mannered, slightly heroic host, Jeff Bacon. This is Jeff Bacon with the DIY Writer Podcast, and today we have a heck of a treat with us. We're going to be talking to Chris Humphreys. Chris Humphreys is an award-winning author and an actor and also a swordsman. So let's just jump right into it because he has very limited time because he's a much busier guy than I am. So Chris, off to you. How are you doing today? I'm doing so well, Jeff. Thank you very much. It's, it's a little early over here in British Columbia, but uh, I'm fueled with caffeine and I'm ready to tackle anything you want to ask me. Awesome. So in the um, essence of uh, being in a hurry, not really ah. in a hurry, ah, whatever. Let's talk about your tapestry trilogy. Ah, yes. Okay. Let's get well, right uh, into it. <laughs> let, oh, well, that was, that was a, a, a swift jump into the, into the deep end. That's good. Um, so, um, yes, I mean, as, as you, as your, uh, your intro said, I'm, I'm a, an author and an actor and all that. Um, I, I, uh, I, I dived in, it's got a slightly unusual history, this, uh, the Tapestry Trilogy, because it, it's like, like me, like many authors these days, I've become what they call a hybrid author in that I'm still writing, um, books for the big publishers. Uh, mm -hmm. in my case, I've only ever written for Penguin Random House and Hachette. The two, the two biggest in the world, um, and I've sort of gone back and forth between the two of them. Um, and but I'm also starting to publish my own books. Um, ones usually they're ones that I've got the rights back to that I felt didn't get enough of a kick of a can, you know, the first time mm -hmm. around. And uh, that's that's the case with this one. Um, the 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 tapestry trilogy is obviously made up of three books. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah, that's, I'll just point that out. Uh, and uh, the first book is called uh, The Hunt of the Unicorn. Okay. And it, it began, you know, I'm always quite interested in origin stories, how, you know, where the, I, and I think listeners are often interested in, you know, where do these ideas come from? And, you know, sometimes they're a, a lightning bolt of inspiration and sometimes they are, you know, this steady sort of accretion. This, this was a lightning bolt um, because my, Knopf, my US publisher in um, at Random House, uh, my editor there, I'd written a trilogy of young adult fant fantasy for her called the Runestone Saga. And at the end of that, I hadn't intended to go that route at all. I was a historical fiction guy, right? Mm -hmm. I'd written four novels, I think, at that stage. She said to me, yeah, so what next? And I went, oh, you know, I kind of had no idea. And I was sitting in my, uh, my basement office. I was living in Vancouver, BC at the time. And I literally started fiddling with my head my hands I was sort of you know I, you can't see what I'm doing here but I was just <laughs> and I and I was playing with my my fingers and I you know what am I going to write what am I going to write what am I why do I wear a unicorn on my finger because I mean I'll, I'll send you a, a photo if you like but I've got a, a unicorn ring which I've worn since I was 18 years old because it is the family crest oh uh, the Humphreys family it's makes me sound noble and ancient, which I'm neither of those things. No, I am ancient, but I'm not noble. Um, and uh, my, it was my great grandfather, who was actually a horse dealer and auctioneer, who decided he wanted to become a gentleman. So he had to obviously have a crest. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so he adopted the rampant unicorn. Anyway, I, I, there I am in my basement with the rampant unicorn on my finger thinking, what is it? Why do I wear this symbol? What does this symbol mean? And I started casting around, of course, you know, went on the internet. The first thing that came up was uh, that it is unconquerable, except by a maiden. And I thought, maidens, unicorns, good combo. Um, secondly, that it could cure all illness and poisons, and dare I say, viruses. Where's a unicorn when we need one? Yeah. <laughs> and, and thirdly, um, that um, I found these amazing tapestries, the unicorn tapestries, which are in the Cloisters Museum in New York which is the, the, the medieval wing of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Mm -hmm. and, um, and as soon as I looked at them, I thought, oh, this, this has to be it. Um, partly because my research strategy is to set books where I like to go, and I always love New York, so I thought that's going to be a good visit. Um, anyway, I came up with this idea, and, and uh, uh, the tapestries became kind of like the wardrobe in Narnia. They became the, the portal between our world and uh, another world, Goloth, the land of the fabulous beast, okay. where, all, where all our myths live. I mean, literally all our myths, particularly the ones related to fabulous beasts like unicorns and um, mm -hmm. griffins and manticores and eventually dragons, which is the, the second part of this story. 
You can't um, have fantasy without a dragon. Well, I, I managed the first book without. But, <laughs> um, and so the, the basic premise is that there's quite, you know, straightforward. Well, she's, she's obviously got a few special things about her. A teenager in Manhattan called Elaine. Though her full name is Alice Elaine. Um, because as her father, who's actually dying of leukemia, don't want to make it all heavy to start with, but he's very ill, mm -hmm. uh, says to her, um, you know, you, there's this family story we have. You know, I read it to you when you were very young, but it's about this pact made between a unicorn and your ancestor, the original Alice Elaine, that if either ever needed the other, uh, they, they, that they could be, you know, they would come. And so 500 years later, every daughter in the family is called Alice Elaine because they, just in case the summons comes and she goes, it's a fantasy story. Anyway, she's standing in front of the unicorn tapestry and Moonspill, which is the name of the 500 year old unicorn, Mm -hmm. summons her uh, and into this as I say this world of the, of the fabulous beast but it's also a medieval world ruled by a tyrant called Leo who's a very handsome charismatic bad boy and um, he's his the way he proves his right to be king his father's just died and he sees going to be the next Leo is to slay a unicorn in the arena and he's captured Moonspill's mate Heartsease and so um, uh, Moonspill has summoned her to basically tame him. She, he, he feels a maiden will tame him and then he won't run amok and he'll be able to think and free his mate. Well, of course, you know, as Elaine says, you know, she knows nothing about unicorn taming. She barely passed calculus. So, it, um, you know, and, and so that it, it, it's, that's the beginning of the story. You know, uh, uh, this, this uh, young woman who, you know, uh, eventually um, obviously displays the required um, courage and skills, but it, it's, it's that Joseph Campbell thing of, of uh, the hero and the, uh, the refusal of the call and all that. Hey, don't, you know, I can't do this. I'm just a kid. Yeah. And, uh, and so through various adventures, um, um, I won't obviously give away the ending, but there's various adventures in Goloff and some funny, some heart rending uh, and, um, and I would, I won't, as I say, give anything away, but just point out that the fact that the unicorn can cure illness might have an effect in her world. I won't say anything else. <laughs> so that's, that was book one. And that came out and you know, it did okay. Uh, mm -hmm. It didn't sell in the gazillions, but it did okay. I thought that was it. I was never going to write another story. Uh, not another story about, about that. I thought it was a one-off. And then a few years later, I started wondering about that happily ever after thing. Sure. You know, Cinderella and the prince, you know, they lived happily ever after. <laughs> yeah. Or after three months, he's out with the guys playing golf all the time. She's stuck in a bloody tower in a castle going, yeah, yeah needlepoint really sucks. You know, I mean, <laughs> what, what are they going to, what are we going to, you know, so what happens and also what happens when someone has done something amazing, you know, can she just go back to high school? You mm -hmm. know, so, so we rejoin her a couple of years later. And that was really the impetus of that was I thought, well, I'm interested in what followed. You know what she could have you know almost a touch of ptsd really I mean, what would what would that look like and um so she's now at columbia college studying languages there's a, a link there but i won't again give that away right. uh, and um she uh she gets basically um um a, a dragon comes and like probes her mind and says you will come to me and this is not your cozy how to train a dragon dragon this yeah. is monster dragon oh. and the dragons have finally awoken in Goloth and they want him awake on earth and she, and so Elaine goes back for the new quest the hunt of the dragon mm -hmm. and so I got to play with all the dragon mythology as well and she finds a world sort of riven by civil war and stuff and and a very different tyrant um and um so so that's those adventures and I wrote that book and um uh, that was that was only published by Doubleday another great house um but but only in canada so when i got the rights back to that i thought i'm gonna write a third book and make it a trilogy mm -hmm. um because one of the things i discovered about dragons was that you know i i decided not to just focus on the european dragon or the right the st george and the dragon uh, and i looked at them all and i discovered that eastern dragons uh, particularly chinese dragons have the ability to shape shift Right. And I thought, now that would be cool. They could actually, they can actually like turn into humans for yep. a couple of hours while they can hold their shift and in which time they can get up to unspeakable things. So I thought, yeah, serial killer shape-shifting dragons in California. That sounds cool. <laughs> so, uh, so I then wrote that book. Yeah.
and that that's basically the saga and i brought that out uh, i brought out the you know new covers i've got fabulous covers if you're if your guests mm -hmm. uh, want to go and have a look at my my website author chrishumphreys.com absolutely beautiful covers designed by a lady called astra crompton out this way very heraldic very mythological um and um yeah, it was love. I mean, I, you know, you do get very fond of your characters and it was mm -hmm. lovely to spend that time with, uh, with her. And in, in the second book, I, I, I mean, you know, the publishers like to, like to sort of bracket things and label them as young, young adult, you know, mark they can target. I, I never think I'm writing a young adult book. I'm just writing a good story. Mm -hmm. the, um, Hunter the Unicorn was actually runner up in an adult fiction prize out here in British Columbia. You know, I've, I've mo a lot of people who write to me about the books and I do get a lot of mail about it, um, um, actually, because they're quite moving in some ways, I think. You know, they've got that, they've got the fun and they've got the excitement, but they've got a real sort of heart at the, at the core of them. And in the second book, Hunter the Dragon, I really wanted to deal with more diversity. So I've, I've got this, this great character called We, who's a Vietnamese, well, son of Vietnamese refugees from Canada. He's uh, uh, a gay computer geek Thai boxing genius. <laughs> he's a, and he's her buddy, because you always need a buddy. And, right. um, and the adventures he gets up to when he falls in love with the sexy pirate Scarab, who's this, uh, who's this very amoral dude in Goloth. Uh, uh, he, he, they, they have fun. And uh, yeah, there's a, it's, um, so, so there's, there's more diversity in them. There's more, um, you know, she's obviously got older. It's dealing with perhaps a bit more adult themes. There's also a, you know, without being heavy about it all, there's a there's a, a, a climate change sub theme in it all, in that Goloth is being polluted by man, and obviously yeah. our Earth is being uh, corrupted by man, um, and so there's a there's an element of uh, you know what can we do about that, which particularly plays out in the third book, Shapeshifters. Oh, cool. J Jeff, I've just ranted at you for about ten minutes. Is that all right? That is perfect. That's no problem. Good, so good. this uh, the so you have the rights back to these books and you uh, you self publish those. I self I, I self publish them. Yeah, they're available on Amazon, and you can get them as um, as obviously as a as an ebook. Mm -hmm. You can also get them as a print on demand. Um, I just ordered them myself to check them out, and actually they did a fine job. You, yeah. You'd never tell you weren't buying a book in a store. That it's a really good job. Hunter the Unicorn is also available as an audio book, read by me. Mm -hmm. um, because um, I mean that's my that's been my uh, you know the, the word everyone uses these days is pivot and that's been my pivot I've now I'm making almost a full-time living as an audiobook narrator oh I can believe that uh, huh. oh well, thank you uh, so I, I've just finished a 200,000 word book about the Norwegian resistance you know and I'm, I'm taking <laughs> taking commissions anyone out there needs an audiobook narrator yeah so I'm doing a lot a lot of that from from a from a, 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 a duvet fort craftily created on Salisbury Island. <laughs> so, how do you like making audiobooks? I assume that's kind of second nature for you. Um, well, you know, I'm I'm not the world's most tech person, so it took me a while to learn it. Um, I, I I was a bit of a technophobe, and then I've gradually adopted the. Uh, I've realized that. Um, if I have a problem with something, there's going to be someone who's going to help me with it. There's going to be a YouTube video to help me with it. Yeah. And so, uh, so I, I had to learn quite a lot. I had, I found this amazing recording system, having been playing with all the musical ones like Pro Tools and stuff, which I found immensely complicated and I just simply didn't need the mm -hmm. functionality. I found this great one called, a, a bizarrely of all things, Hindenburg. Okay. It's a Danish system. And um, yeah, so that's um, that that's uh, and it's very user friendly. So I record on that, and um, you know, it, it really does everything for you. That and GarageBand, I think those two are probably the easiest ones to use. They're very easy, but GarageBand doesn't have quite the same functionality because it's it's again aimed a little more for music. So I've got great filters on uh, in the that I can compress and take out noise and um, actually put. There's a wonderful thing called um, no, uh, Voice Profiler, which is literally my best voice recorded in a proper studio. Take a minute of that, put it into the system and apply it to any track. So it's like I have an engineer adjusting to my best voice. So that's right. Yeah, you're a tech guy. You'll understand all that. Well, I don't know if I really understand that as far as voice engineering, but I do know that um, the things I've read about it because I want to do my own audio books. Yeah, uh, those are the two softwares that everybody uh, uh, talks about is is Hindenburg and, and GarageBand. Oh yeah, yeah. I'd get. I mean, it's it's six hundred bucks or something, but it's worth 
every penny. I've done maybe 10 books now and I'm you know, earning, earning a reasonable living, you know, so. Um, and, and I do my own books as well. So Hunt of the Unicorn is up at, um, the best place to get it is Find Away Voices. If you just looked up Find, find Away Voices, yep. you, you, know, you can buy it direct from there. Or, I mean, you can get it all the usual outlets as well. So, right. but um, yeah, so that's, that's, uh, that's quite cool. The, um, the other book I should mention, I suppose, just because it's sort of um, appropriate for our times, uh, slightly sadly, and is doing really well right now, particularly in the US, would you believe, is a novel with the simple title of Plague. <laughs> you, you were going you were going to talk about plague. Weren't you? <laughs> I was going to ask you about it. I, you know, like to yeah. do a little research every now and then. Oh well, bravo, bravo. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so plague. Um, yeah, as the title implies, it, it's about that. Now there are people. It's, it's a historical fiction novel. It's essentially a religious fundamentalist serial killer story set during the Great Plague of London in 1665, which was the the, the last Great Plague that devastated London. Uh, and it concerns a highwayman, a thief taker, who's basically the cop is after him, and an actress whose husband has disappeared. And uh, they're being ritually, people are being ritually murdered. Okay. Uh, there's clues that this is not just ordinary murders. And uh, the highwayman is suspected and needs to prove his innocence. So it's, it's, a, it's a thriller, a historical thriller. It actually, if I may blow my own very small trumpet for a moment, won the best crime novel in Canada four years ago. Oh, cool which was very cool, which was a big shock to me because I thought I'd been nominated for a crime award. I'm not a crime writer. I've won a crime award. How did that happen? Guess um, what, you're a crime writer. Uh, it looks like I'm a crime writer, yeah, yeah. Um, but, but again, you know, for many people who read historical fiction, uh, the, you know, one of the things people read it for is to, is to immerse themselves in a time where maybe some questions are being asked that are being asked again now. You know, how, how, how different are we now? How, how much the same are we? How much people don't really change over the years? Um, so there are some people who go, the last thing I want to do is read about the pandemic <laughs> or, or a pandemic. And other people go, yes, I need to get more uh, a, a sense of, of the world and place it in, 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 uh, in context of our world. So, I mean, you know, I, as I say, I, I, I write I write adventure tales, I write thrillers, I write, um, you know, the Hunter, the, the Tapestry trilogies are really essentially thrillers, you know, the, to get people to, um, to keep turning the page. Sure. And, um, but if there are other themes working that people like to think about and explore, then great, I've done, a, I've done twice the job, I suppose. The, the one question I kind of have for you is, you know, you've been published with Penguin <clears throat> and now you've gone to self-publishing. Uh, what's the, what's the difference in that for you? I mean, is it, uh, is it night and day or is it something that you're, you're kind of enjoying self-publishing versus being published or would you go back the other way? Uh, well, I'm doing both because I, here's a, a third thing I should probably talk about. I am being currently published by, uh, Dolance, who are the, probably the best fantasy house in the world. One of the best fantasy houses in the world. Old venerable. He published Orwell and Du Maurier and people like that back in the day. Um, but now they're mainly focus on uh, fantasy and science fiction. And so I'm, I've, I've just, pub I've, with them, they have just published my second book. I'm, I've written a, what's called a high epic, I suppose, fantasy series mm -hmm. called Immortal's Blood is the series. The first book is called Smoke in the Glass. And it's essentially a, um, a tale of immortality and immortals and the cost of immortality to a world where the elites, basically the sort of 1%, again, a little political thing in there, mm -hmm. are, are the immortals. And they rule these three very different worlds, a Norse world kind of, a Mesoamerican world kind of, okay. and a, a kind of Greco-Roman world. Um, so yeah, so that's being published by Golans. Um, so I'm, I'm, I am back and forth. The, to answer your question, the, the advantages of uh, the self-publishing I mean, I, you know, I used to be a guy who'd think the most I want to do uh, is write the book and then show up at the launch party and drink warm Chardonnay, you know, and, <laughs> and, 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 and be polite to, <laughs> to, to publicists and stuff like that. Um, right. And that, when I started out, because I'm a bit long in the tooth now, I published my first novel 20 years ago. That was what one did. You know, you weren't required. You didn't need a website. You didn't need, there was no social media. Right. Um, you know, I didn't have to do any of that. Um, the publishing game has changed so much that the big publishers are requiring you to do that now. It's almost in the contract. So, and, you know, like with 
casting in my other world of acting, often if you're going up for a leading role, the, one of the first things they'll check is not your performance, but how many Twitter followers you have. I mean, it's, it's oh, sick, it's sick. Yeah. Um, but uh, so, so, you know, you know if, I, if, I was, if I had my druthers, as they say, I would, I would prefer to just write books. Mm-hmm. However, I do acknowledge the buzz to be got from being self-published being in control of your, um, your dates, your publication dates, being in full control of the cover. I always have input on my covers, but full control. Uh, ha- um, being able to play the pricing game, to do promos and stuff. Sure. I am, I am f- far and away not the uh, sharpest tool in that drawer, um, or the sharpest knife. I'm, um, you know, I, I've, I always work on a sort of need to know basis. So I, I get my stuff out there. Uh, and I do a bit of promotion, but I don't do a lot of advertising or stuff like that. You know, I, I sort of rely on the books to, and, and it's probably slightly crazy given the amount of stuff that's out there. You know, the, the, the indie world is very similar to the, um, the, uh, the legit, I suppose, world or the, or the straight publishing world in that there's always um, a lot, of ev- not everyone, but most people think they can write a book. And it's simply not true. Um, you know, I mean, they can, they can write a book, but, but for a, a lot of people, unless they've had help, unless they've studied the craft of it, it's probably not going to turn out so well. However, if they are the best marketer in the world, they will outsell me a hundred to one. Sure. You know? and, and that's not dissing any, any work that's out there or anyone else who's worked really hard to write a book because just finishing a draft is a high achievement. But you know, I I, uh, uh, I I do know that you know in the publishing world it was always the same. There was a lot of you, you to get someone's attention, initially editors or publishers or agents. Mm-hmm. You know, you had to wade through mountains of paper to get to them because of the slush pile. You know, people were right. away. Um, and uh, so so that's still that's still true of the indie world as well. But listen, I'm making a you know I'm getting these books out there. I'm having interesting chats with people like you. I'm doing the uh, the, the promos and stuff. And you know you you are, there's always something an indefinable thing with publishing any book. You've got to hope it's going to catch fire. That some review will stimulate uh, you know ten people right. to buy it. Who will tell twenty? Who will tell fifty? And suddenly New York Times bestseller. You know. Um, you always hope that will happen. But what I also realized, and this was the big, big learn I, I, I got when I was uh, first starting out, the difference between my two worlds. As an actor, you have opening night, right? You have opening night, you aim for opening night, and then you get the reviews in, and then you, you know, either sell uh, thousands of tickets or close, you know, within a week. Yeah. Um, so I, I kind of expected, yeah, it's going to be the same. Publishing is a long game. You know, right. you publish the book. Yes, you hope to sell a lot of you may make a buzz and uh, and sell a lot of copies initially, but um, if you know you've got to play the long game. You've got to think. Well, you know the book's out there. People are reading it. Some people are buying it every day. You know, if I if I open up my um, my uh, Amazon website and check my stats, you know, I go, oh, no, you know, there's there's the Ku people who are reading pages every day, mm-hmm. which you know we get a little money for. And there's the sales. And, and some days you'll think, oh, I sold five paperbacks today. That's, that's 100 bucks in my pocket. Thank you very much. Mm-hmm. Other days you think, why did no one read my book? So. <laughs> and then other days when, uh, <clears throat> you know, the Amazon uh, database isn't quite working and all of a sudden it's like, whoa, I sold 30. What the heck happened? Uh, yeah. yeah just yeah, catching right. up. <clears throat> that's right. That's actually absolutely right. So, yeah. It's kind of fun. It's yeah. kind of fun. The uh, the one thing that I find as I talk to more and more authors is that uh, um, if they want to write something that's kind of out of the box, it's best to be self-published versus trying to get a publisher to bite onto it because it may not quite fit into what their publishing plans are or their scheduling or they just aren't sure how to market it. So, uh, uh, you know, self-publishing something that's a creative piece of work, but it may kiss too many genres for the uh, publisher's taste. You know that that's exactly right, Jeff. And uh, in fact, I'm I'm uh, engaged in something like that right now because I've written. I I, I it was kind of like me as an actor. Uh, people couldn't really pin me down. You know, I started out as a bit of a pretty boy on TV, and and you know, but but after you know, my my biggest role that took me to Hollywood in the end was I. You know, I'm I'm a you know Londoner, 
half Norwegian, half English, kind of Northern European kind of guy. And then I ended up playing a Jewish zealot turned gladiator in a biblical Roman epic called Anno Domini. <laughs> You know, and 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 but but and then you know, really dark, and and then and then I, I've I've since I've been fortunate that since that I've done uh, I've done lots of um, lots of uh, you know character, much more character work. But so people were never able to quite guess what I was. I'm, it's the same in my writing. I'm I'm pretty eclectic. You know, I hop from historical fiction to fantasy. Uh, I um, and they're not conventional fantasies normally either. Um, marketers and publicists would much prefer to keep you in a box. Right. Um, I, I make it slightly harder for them because they go, well, what's this book? And I've written a, um, a thriller, a modern day. It's called, it's called One London Day. And it, because all the action takes place on one day in London in 2018, in this very hot summer. And okay. it's about a hit and the victim of the hit. You have follow the hit man, then you follow the victim a few days back, and then you follow oh, cool. his new obsession then you follow her boyfriend who's in love with a russian escort and then the whole thing is um, um masterminded by these um this really shady british spy operation who are organizing the hits and the murders and stuff so it's called one on the day i'm, I'm good now the publishers of london almost to a man and a woman read it raved about it, it was the nicest rejection letters i ever got people going quite interesting. <laughs> film noir and there's no real protagonist there's all all these protagonists and and uh, you know and it's so different and black but i have no idea what this is so so i think right well if you don't i do and i'm going to publish it so right <laughs> so that, that'll, be, that'll, be, that'll be coming out in the next couple of months i'm going to get that out there i think that's hilarious i got some of the nicest rejection letters i've ever gotten <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah this they're is so cool. kind and polite they loved it no, they're they, not loved, gonna do they it. loved it but they had no box they had no box to put it into so yeah um, Yep. No, that's, that's sometimes the, uh, the case from, for a lot of people. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if you know, Kat Rambo, I was talking to her, she's published a ton of books and know the name. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, she kind of, that's the way she works that she has an agent. And if the agent can't sell it, she says, screw it. You know what? I'm just going to do it myself. And so she has a pile of self-published, a pile of published and you know, yep. that's just the way she runs, but she's yep. been very, very successful in doing it. That's good. You know, that's the model. I mean, I need to be more successful. I should probably take it more, um, more, uh, you know, put more time into the actual marketing side of it. But, uh, you know, I'm, as I say, I'm quite happy with it poodling along. And, and uh, you know, my, my plan is to get all my backlist back and get it out there myself, mm -hmm. you know, in which I've done a lot of lately. I've got a lot, I've got my first two books back just recently. I'm going to get those out there quite soon as well. So, um, you know, I don't mean to cut this short. I want to be respectful of your time because I know. Yes, it's, no, I've, 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 I, I, as you know, I've, 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 uh, I've got the things piling up today. So I've got about got another things ten piling minutes. up today, which is fine, which is fine. Ten minutes, ten minutes, Jeff. Ask me anything you want. Well, the first thing I want to ask you about is your audio books or, you know, you recording audio books. How can people get a hold of you if they want you to, uh, to uh, do their audio book for them? Oh, well, uh, yeah, it's funny. People track me down. I, again, I don't tend to market myself. People just find me. Um, well, uh, I suppose the best way would be to send an email to, uh, and I'll send this as you can put the link up, but it's quite straightforward. It's Theatre Alive 2020. And, and theatre spelt the British way, not the American way. So okay. theatre, R-E, alive, 2020 at gmail.com. That's my sort of uh, overall, I, I, run, I run a small theatre company actually called Theatre Alive here on Salt Spring, but it's also useful for, for my... Um, for my audiobook world. So theaterlive2020 at gmail.com will reach me. Um, I'm, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm always willing to consider interesting projects. So, so uh, yeah, and I do a multiplicity of voices. I actually, because I, I was a Californian kid, so I record American as well, so. Well, let's hear a voice. What? Dude, okay, man, I used to be a Californian surfer kind of guy. <laughs> I was down there on the beaches of Zuma and uh, Newport. <laughs> very cool i've only got this voice oh, oh right fair enough yeah well i do lots of european as well of course because i played germans and norwegians and yeah you know, lots of all, all kinds of how things. hard is it to develop a, a a voice like that i mean how much how much you have to practice i mean if you get a new dialect that you uh that you're trying to uh, perfect? I mean, how many hours do you have to put into something like that? Well, you, you know, it depends. I mean, I, the, I have a facility for certain accents because uh, and it's partly because I was an American kid till I was seven years old growing up in California. So, so it, I, I like the more sort of uh, 
the wider vowels actually so i can do very good west country accents in england and and mm -hmm. uh, I'll do a good cockney as well i suppose because i'm a londoner right mm -hmm. uh and uh but um i i uh and and the european accents um i can't do welsh to save my soul it always comes out pakistani <laughs> it's dreadful i won't even try it now um so um you know, if if I have to learn an accent for something, yeah, you 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 put in you put in the time. Uh, it doesn't usually take me too long. I did, I used to do a, a quite a bit of cartoon work as well, and you're always being called upon to do different things. I was in a, a long running '90s cartoon called Hurricanes, which was about an international soccer team, and okay. I was three, three of the main voices on that, including a German Helmut von Beethoven striker as the team, and um, and various sort of villains, and uh, so. You know, I mean, there are some, as I say, some accents come more easily. I, I, I did an, a one man show, uh, Samuel Beckett, you know, the amazing Irish writer. I did a, a play called Crap's Last Tape, and I did that a couple of years ago in a, in a Dublin accent. So that one required a bit more work because I wanted to be, I didn't want to be generic Irish boyo, you know. Yeah. <laughs> I, wanted, I wanted something more specific, and he was from Dublin, so I did that. But yeah, it's, it's you know, that's part of the work. You just do the work. Sure. So, yeah. Well, that makes sense. And um, so blah, 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 blah. where was I going to go with this? Anyway, you do your own audio books. And I assume that, you, you know, you said you record them in your studio and then you send them to uh, Findaways. Is that Findaway right? Voices is the what they call an aggregator. Yeah, I, I right. like them rather than being exclusive with Amazon, uh, partly because mm -hmm. Amazon will tie you up for seven years. Right. So you right. Can, you know, I like Findaway because you can play with the pricing and stuff. I mean, you know, um, the there are advantages and disadvantages but I, I like them they're a good good outfit um and i have my own I, they set up something called authors direct so literally i have a i have a storefront there so if you go to my you go there the ones i've recorded myself not the publishers ones you can right you can record i i also record my own books for my publishers so smoke in the glass and the coming of the dark which are the first two books of that high epic fantasy series i talked about they're available from Audible and you know all those all mm -hmm. the traditional outlets because they're they're controlled by my publisher. So, but it's not it's it's what we call double bubble in England. They they pay you for the book and then they pay you to record the book. So, well, that's kind of cool. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, yeah. And I just sit, sit in this cedar octagon wrapped up in you know I've got basically it's all soft furnishings. You know, it is a duvet fort and yeah. with a great great mic and a great recording system. And I I have at it. It's fun. Very cool. Very cool. Um, you know, with that, I'm going to say that, uh, you know, let's go ahead and end the show real quick. Um, mm -hmm. I do appreciate the time. Like I said, you know, you cut out a little bit of time for me today. I do, uh, um, as I do the show notes, I'll put all the links. So if there's anything that you, uh, you uh, missed or whatever that you want in the show notes, just send it to email it to me and, and we'll get it in there. I will do that. When, when are you likely to go up with it? Uh, we're going to go up with it in the next two weeks. Oh, great. Okay. Well, that gives me a few days. I'll, I'll probably get some, you know, final stuff to you by the weekend anyway. Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds good. But with that, Chris Humphreys, thank you very much for your time today. It's been a great pleasure being with you in Wisconsin. I, you know what? It's it's probably a little warmer there, but it's wetter there. Uh, it's right. very much wetter here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You, you take good care. Thanks for the interview. I really enjoyed yep. it. This is Jeff of the DIY Writer uh, Podcast telling you have a good day and keep your chin up. Bye-bye. Please hit the subscribe button. I get a bonus for every subscriber and I only need 1,506 more to become a full-time paid employee. Help me please.